Hi, if you're uh, watching uh, number 480 Otis on the Brooks Falls cam, this is Mike Fitz. Uh, I am a park ranger at Katmai National Park and Preserve. I'm going to get ready for a live broadcast here uh, and answer viewer questions starting at 3 o'clock Alaska time, 7 p.m. Eastern time. There are a few other and then I'm uh, going to pan around and show you the landscape. But then at 3 p.m. Alaska time, I'll be uh, on the camera. Uh, I don't have a cameraman today to uh, look at other bears behind me, but I'll be doing my best to try to answer your questions. So stand by for the live chat, and in the meantime, we'll just enjoy the bears that we can see.
Good afternoon from Brooks Falls. My name is Mike Fitz and I'm a park ranger at Katmai National Park and Preserve. I'm standing on a wildlife viewing platform, specially designed to allow people to watch bears here at Brooks Falls. We were just looking at number 435 Holly and her two uh, cubs. One of them happens to be adopted on the far side of the river. Is number 480 Otis, one of the older adult males that we have on the river here. While these bears are here, uh, during today's live chat, I want to talk about the bears, the activity that we're seeing, and I also want to answer a viewer questions as best I can. So uh, I know there are many things that people are wondering about, what the bears are doing, how they're doing it. This is the latest of our live chats here, um, brought to you by Explore.org, and we're uh, very uh, happy and pleased with the partnership that we have uh, with Explore.org, uh, the Brooks River Bears, uh, to anybody around the world with an internet connection. If you have questions for me uh, today, you can um, submit your questions to our camp page on a page below all of the other icons for the different cameras that they have and post your questions there. A moderator from Excel will uh, be feeding me questions uh, via Skype and I'll be uh, uh, taking those questions um, a little bit later on in the broadcast. So uh, the family of, of bears have moved move downstream out of my line of sight. It looks like it's only number 480 Otis in the far pool here. He's been here for about an hour. I've seen him catch one fish. And number 480 I think is certainly a master at patience. He can um, definitely stereotype a lot of bears to, to have certain behaviors or characteristics. You can say bears are a lot of things, but they are certainly patient. If a bear learns that a technique is going to give him a huge reward in food, then he's going to be able to practice that technique over and over and over again, and sometimes demonstrate extreme patience in doing it. And I think number 480 is one of those bears that we have here in Brooks River that really does exemplify how important patience can be to an animal. So I'm going to take a moment to step out from behind the camera and reveal myself once I get the camera positioned properly. I'll try to get the falls in the background so you can watch bears that are walking behind me. And again, my name is Mike Fitz. I am a uh, park ranger here at Katmai National Park and Preserve. I'm very pleased that you could join me for today's uh, live broadcast. This will be the last live chat that I'll be doing from Brooks Falls this season, most likely. I am leaving Brooks River uh, for uh, the headquarters in King Salmon tomorrow. So uh, I won't be out here, but our cams are going to be live as long as uh, the, the weather cooperates uh, and doesn't blow down any of our antennas, which happened uh, just a couple days ago. And as long as we have enough solar energy uh, to power the cams, then we, we will certainly have the cams broadcast. Uh, over the next month or so, we'll probably have limited hours for our, our, our cams here at Brooks River um, to conserve power. So our dumpling cam may be powered down at night. The Brooks Falls cam that I'm on right now may be powered down at night. And the lower river camera uh, will, probably will start to be powered down at, at night as well. And that's to help us conserve energy so we can have these cameras uh, uh, stay live uh, as, as long as possible throughout the winter. Because we are, I am very curious to know what goes on here in the winter. We don't have any staff stationed out at Brooks Camp 
during the uh, the winter season. Although I would like to live here during the winter time, they just don't let me do it quite yet. They uh, as they say I have to work on other things at the headquarters in King Salmon. So. Uh, this year, I think if we have the cameras up and live, it'll be a really great thing for all of us to see just uh, what the activity is like. How long will bears be here, for instance? Will we see bears into late November, maybe even early December, because some bears can be active then? Uh, in the springtime, when will we see the first bear? Will it be uh, in early March, or uh, or will it come later in the season? And what about the other wildlife that's in the area, too? What about the moose? Uh, what about the... Uh, the wolves, the wolverines, the, the little creatures too that we might um, not notice when the bears are here like the minks and the river otters. So there's a lot I think that we can look forward to even though the season is kind of winding down here at Brooks River. But our bears are probably still going to be here. Many of them are still going to be here throughout the entire month of October. I don't know how long 480 Otis is going to leave or going to stay before he leaves and go to his, uh, his hibernation site. But he could certainly be here for a month or, or more. Uh, bear activity on Brooks River in the fall usually peaks around the first week of October. So I think we're slowly going to start to see bear numbers decrease over the next uh, few weeks. But that's to be expected. That's nothing uh, that to alarm you. Many bears are very fat and they're at their probably peak size right now. So they're in good shape to go to their dens um, in, in the wintertime. So uh, that's uh, something that you can look for. You can look for uh, lesser numbers of bears over the coming weeks, and many of those bears are going to be migrating to their denning sites. Uh, again, during this broadcast, uh, I will be taking questions from you. If you want to uh, submit questions, go to uh, the comment section on any bear camp page on explore.org, and you can uh, submit those questions. The comments are at the bottom of the bear camp pages, so scroll down to the bottom of the screen, and you'll be able to find uh, those. Uh, and a moderator, Courtney, um, from Explore.org, she's going to be uh, posting those questions and feeding me those questions as they, as they come in. And I'll do my best to try to answer as many questions as possible. I know many of you, though, are curious about what happened to, bring the cam or to take the cams offline uh, just a, a couple of days ago. And we had some very stormy, cold weather that, that pushed through the area. The highest wind gust, I think, that we recorded down at the visitor center at the mouth of Brooks River was 40 miles an hour out of the north. And we're sort of on the, on the uh, out of, with the north wind, we're sort of on the lee, lee side and the uh, protected side of Dumpling Mountain from a north wind. So if it blew 40 miles an hour down at the visitor center, a north wind on Dumpling Mountain on the top of that mountain where our, where our uh, repeater is, our radio repeater that shoots the signal out to King Salmon and the rest of the world had to have been uh, quite extreme. Uh, I went up there yesterday thinking that we had just run out of um, methane fuel. There's also fuel cells up there that help to power the cameras uh, through the through the wintertime and when there's not enough solar power in the summertime. Uh, and I expected maybe just to be able to swap out some fuel jugs and power the cams up that way. But it actually wasn't a power issue. It was a, an issue with one of the antennas actually blew over. Uh, the wind was so strong that it snapped uh, the welding off of one of the pipes that held the pipe up in the air, snapped that off, and when I got there, it was laying on the ground. So I had to sort of jerry-rig it, and I um, removed, luckily one of the radios was not damaged, and I was able to remove that um, using so, following some instructions from uh, one of the technicians uh, from Explore.org, and uh, remove that radio and mount it to a different um, antenna that was still attached um, to the, the repeater site. And thankfully, it was not damaged, and it's still working. So. Keep your fingers crossed that another uh, really strong wind event doesn't blow the, the repeater down. Uh, we've lost radio repeaters on Dumpling Mountain before. Uh, last winter, the highest wind gust down, on, uh, down at the visitor center that our anemometer recorded was nearly 80, um, or actually over 80 miles an hour. So again, on top of a mountain, it could be uh, Dumpling Mountain 2,000 feet, uh, 2,440 feet to be exact in elevation. Uh, the winds up there can be extremely strong. Uh, so hopefully we don't have winds uh, blowing down uh, our, our repeaters in, in the future. Down here along the river though, the bears, uh, in these windy conditions, sometimes they seem to behave a bit more, a bit more skittish. Uh, interestingly, in, interestingly enough, I mean their eyesight is, is 
probably about as good as ours. Their hearing is about as good as ours. But th they rely on their sense of smell more than anything else. And when there are very strong winds blowing through the area, bears probably have a harder time locating the source of different scents. So if they're trying to smell their way through the world, which bears probably do, and their, their sense of smell is many times greater than a, an average dog's, and they're trying to smell their way through the world, really strong winds probably uh, hinder their sense of smell, and they can be a, a bit more skittish. They don't really mind the wind, or excuse me, the, the rain. They really don't mind the cold temperatures so much. Uh, but really, the wind does affect their, um, their behavior. In fact, I see the bears next to one another, you know, in calm conditions, and they seem to know what's going on. But bears seem to react towards each other from a, a greater distance when, uh, when the wind is blowing strongly. So if we do have another windy day, maybe that's something that you can look for uh, on the cams too. You're watching a bear, see if it's reacting to other bears. If the cam zoomed out and you can see maybe the whole scene, watch to see how far apart the bears reacting to one another because I think it may be uh, that they react to one another at greater distances under windy conditions. And that is one reason why my, myself I, and other people that are here have to maybe be a bit more cautious around the bears during windy conditions because they may not be able to um, determine the, the source of the smell that they're that they're taking in or they may not be able to pick that that smell up in a, in a sense they might almost be um, blinded uh, because they do rely on their sense of sense of smell um, so much uh, so that's a, a little bit of information about what we had up on the mountain the conditions that we were dealing with yesterday when I went up there to to uh, to troubleshoot the cams it was a nice day it was cold when I got out there it was below freezing but it certainly was a, a, a nicer day um, than the day before so I'm glad that the weather held um, and broke for me just for uh, just for a little bit and uh, I could go up there and troubleshoot the, the bear cams for us uh, also along the river during the past uh, few days we've been seeing uh, many different females with uh, with cubs some of uh, some of them very young cubs some of them uh, older cubs Right before I started the broadcast, or as I started the broadcast, number 435 Holly and her her uh, two cubs uh, walked by Brooks Falls here. We hadn't seen her in uh, maybe over a week or so. She, was, she just uh, came back to the river. We don't know where she was at in the meantime. Maybe she was fishing upriver out of the cam's line of sight. Uh, it's hard to say. Uh, but there are other bears here as well. Number 451 and her three uh, spring cubs. I think I saw her uh, around one o'clock down at the mouth of the river there are differently other many many other family groups that you can watch at the river here at this time of the year and if you want to know more about those individual bears and um, you're just tuning into the bear camps for the first time definitely try to download the uh, identification book for our brooks river bears there's a link to it in the about section under the main um, camera window on explore.org and you can download that book off of the ebook section from katmai's website and I know I have a few questions uh, already lined up in the queue here. As you can see today, I'm flying solo. Ranger Roy is back in King Salmon, so he was not able to join me. We'll be doing some other live broadcast, him and I, probably later this fall. Uh, but I'll try to get to as many of your questions today as possible. Since this is the last live chat of the season, I want to do my best to try to answer any of those burning questions that you might have. So please post those um, in the comment section. Do, the best, do my best to try to answer those uh, questions for you. So I have a few um, in the queue right now, um, so I'm not going to be able to, to read them ahead of time. So let me see what we have here in uh, just a second. So uh, evidently, uh, earlier today, somebody was wa um, on the cams. Uh, people were watching 273 and her cub. Um, it looked like 273 was holding and eating a fish. And her cub went over and started rubbing his, um, his or her chin and neck all over the fish. What does that behavior indicate? You know, I'm not, I'm not really sure. I didn't observe it myself. Uh, but bears like smelly things. Uh, we often see them roll uh, in areas where there's really strong odors. Um, if there's like gasoline or diesel fuel, if that's spilled on the ground, bears often roll in that. Uh, unfortunately, we had a, a diesel fuel spill here or a leak from one of our tanks uh, many years ago actually up near Lake Brooks and actually uh, down at the mouth of Brooks River 
And uh, when I when I found the one up at at, uh, at Lake Brooks, uh, I found it because bears were paying attention to it. I wouldn't have known it otherwise. I watched one bear walk by this spot, and I noticed it actually um, dig some of the earth uh, out of the ground and just roll in that area. And I didn't pay too much attention to it until another bear came by and did the exact same thing a few minutes later. So I went over to the ground and I could smell the diesel fuel um, in the ground. So bears like smelly things and maybe a, a, a smelly fish is just something that they, a scent that they want to be associated with. Not really sure when a, when a bear is maybe sleeping underneath um, one of the wildlife viewing platforms here. We can, we can smell them uh, at this time of the year and they often don't smell very good. So, so they, they, they might just like to have those fish odors on them. Uh, I, I'm not really sure. Even their, um, even their belly holes that they dig, the places that they happen to dig day beds and rest in, and at, even at this time of the year, especially at night, they're, they're resting in beds that they dig for themselves. Um, those places kind of stink like, um, like a combination of wet fur, wet, wet fur and, um, and rotting fish. So if you want to know what a bear maybe smells like at this time of the year, those are, that's kind of the, uh, the, the best way that I can describe it right now is a, a combination of wet, wet fur and, uh, and dead fish. So again, I'm not really sure what was going on and why that cub was rubbing itself on the fish, but they do like stinky things and maybe that's my best guess. Uh, and when, we, when will the, the floating bridge at the mouth of Brooks River uh, be taken down? That'll probably be uh, coming out within the next couple of weeks or so. Uh, I don't know. They haven't set a date for that. Uh, so it'll probably be coming out in the next, um, the, the next couple of weeks. Uh, so you can look forward uh, to watching um, that, that project um, you know, probably by uh, the middle of October. Uh, they're going to be shutting down the, uh, sorry, there's a mink on the platform, and I'm trying to point that out to some of the other people. I'm not going to be able to get to it and turn the, turn the camera around for you. But we've been seeing a lot of little critters um, running around the wildlife viewing platforms, so it's been um, pretty, pretty interesting to, uh, to see those, uh, those little critters, and it's something to look forward to. Um, again, as, you're, as the bears maybe depart the area, yeah. What other wildlife are we going to be seeing? Maybe we're going to get a chance to see some of the minks and watch those animals a bit more carefully. Uh, but going back to the bridge, yeah, I think it'll be uh, probably um, within the ne next couple weeks that you can that you can watch that removal, and we'll try to let everyone know when that happens so you can watch it if you're interested in that project. People are wondering um, about uh, how much salmon are in the water right now. How many salmon are in the water? The ones I see jumping at the falls do not like uh, look like the old spawned out sockeye. Are they coho salmon? And I think most of the most of the salmon that are probably jumping at at the falls right now are uh, silver or coho salmon. Not going to be able to, um, you know, you're probably not going to be able to tell, you know, based on what you're seeing on the cams um, right now. And I, I'd have to watch really, really closely to see what species it is. But most likely, um, the sockeye right now have found their spawning site. The ones that are downstream of the falls have chosen this to spawn downstream of the falls. The ones that are upstream of the falls are going to spawn upstream of the, of the falls. Some of the uh, larger coho or silver salmon, they may be still trying to find the, the right spawning site. So the ones that you're seeing jumping at the falls, probably most likely are mostly uh, silver salmon or, or those coho salmon. There are definitely a lot of fish still in the river right now. Um, down at the mouth, I see a lot of fish um, just hanging out there. They're still staging. They're, right, they're waiting to maybe move a little bit further upriver to spawn at the right time of the year. Down below me, in the water right here, there are still um, many dozens of fish that I can see in the water pretty easily. Um, there's not a lot of um, bright sunshine, as you can see right now, but there's definitely a lot of fish in the water um, below me and those fish are actively spawning. I walked uh, just upstream here to take a look at the fish ladder before the broadcast um, and on the other side of that ladder upstream of the falls a lot of fish still spawning in that area so there are probably thousands and thousands of fish still in Brooks River right now that are in the act of spawning so food is going to be plentiful for the bears for probably the next couple of, of weeks or so. But um, spawning activity at this time of the year is going to decrease and when salmon become 
less accessible to bears when there are, are or when there is less food around then the bears are going to disperse to other places to try to find a last meal or maybe going to try to migrate to their denning sites uh, at this uh, this time of the year so we will that's probably a major reason why we're seeing we're going to see less bears over the month of October is because there's just going to be less sockeye salmon for them to feed on but I think there's still going to be plenty of food in the river for many bears um, throughout the the rest of the month and uh, am I planning any chats from King salmon uh, yes I probably won't be able to do any until um, maybe early next week I can do a, a, another chat um, from King salmon but I have some training that I have to go to um, and then I have some uh, vacation that I'm planning and I'm not going to tell you where I'm going but it's going to be some places that I, uh, I've been to before and that I enjoy so I'm going to be uh, taking a vacation so I won't be in the office uh, in King salmon uh, for, uh, for for a while but um, I'll, I'll try to do maybe a, another live chat early next week uh, maybe Ranger Roy can join me for that and then I'll also uh, try to do some um, in November when I come back uh, from my vacation. So stay tuned for that. We always like to try to talk about denning and hibernation in November as, uh, as a live chat because that's uh, the, what the bears are doing. If they're not in their their den already in November, they're going to their dens, they're getting close to denning site, and their physiology is already switching over at that time of the year into that hibernation mode. So we'll try to do a more specific chat geared toward you. that's something for you to look forward to uh, on on the bear cams at that time so people are wondering of course about uh, about the rundown of the bears that are currently in the area um, you know do they look uh, best prepared for, for the winter and in fact uh, all of the bears that I'm actually seeing now look they look pretty good not all of them are extremely fat like um, like number 480 Otis um, behind me over here but a lot, there's a lot of food around and even though we might not have extremely high numbers of bears on the river right now we still do have um, many bears here and we have a lot of fish uh, and the bears that are here are doing pretty well so I, I honestly I haven't seen a bear that doesn't look like it's uh, to survive hibernation in the in the um, in the spring season they still continue to lose a lot of weight in spring so the bears that are here right now he's not only eating to survive the winter hibernation but period but he's also eating to survive the springtime period happen to arrive uh, so all of the bears here right now they look uh, pretty fat they look pretty healthy outwardly again um, they look good but inwardly I don't know um, are they could suffer um, from arthritis or bone ailments that I can't see. Uh, older bears like 480 Otis, they, they end up m m breaking a lot of teeth over time. Their teeth wear down over time. Um, so maybe that will impair their ability uh, to survive. It's just really hard to say. But we do, I, I do know that the, the salmon run this year was pretty large, one of the largest uh, in the history of Bristol Bay. Uh, and uh, the, the escapement of the salmon coming into the Naknek River watershed and into the Brooks River here was quite, quite large. So the bears that are here are doing, uh, doing pretty well. So some of the bears that people were seeing um, earlier in September aren't here right now. There's a question, anyone seen bear 409 or 868 or 435 lately? Is it possible that some of the bears have already left for hibernation? Well, you know, um, I can answer with, um, I, I give you a definitive answer, of course, with just one of those bears, number 435. She showed up right before the broadcast. Uh, so uh, we hadn't seen her in about a week. Um, so she's, uh, she's still out and about with her two cubs, and they all look uh, fat and healthy. The other bears that were listed in that question, number 409, number 868, um, I haven't seen 409 in a long while. Last time I saw her, um, I guess it's been over a week since I last saw her. She was, she was really fat, um, and maybe I think it would. Now that I'm that I'm thinking about it, I think it was last Friday was the last time that I saw um, 409 um, bead nose. So about a week or so. Whether or not they're moving to their migration site, or ex excuse me, migrating to their hibernation site, I just can't say. 
it's a little bit early for bears to be going into their dens in Katmai since salmon are still available in places like Brooks River. It's possible though that if they their denning sites are far away from here, if they have to migrate a couple dozen miles or more to go to their denning site, it's possible that they might be going uh, to those sites and migrating towards those sites right now. Uh, I, we just don't know. We have very little information about where these individual bears are going when they're not at Brooks River. Uh, so that's a, that's a gap in our knowledge um, right now. 409, when I, last time I saw her, she was huge. She was certainly, in my opinion, she's the fattest bear uh, at Brooks River. We'll find out in the, uh, the Fat Bear Week and the Fat Bear Tuesday contest that'll start um, on next uh, this upcoming Wednesday. Uh, so we'll be posting um, a lot of stuff on Facebook about that um, in the upcoming days but not sure to go into her den whether or not she's going to her migra or uh, her denning site right now uh, I just can't say but it's a distinct possibility probably the bear uh, bears will start to den here in Katmai in um, mid to late October so coming up within the next couple of weeks or so would not be surprising to me if um, bears started to dig their dens and enter their dens at that time of the year question about the um, the single cub um, there uh, there has been a single cub um, that was separated from its mother walking around the river um, has it been reunited with its mother not to my knowledge uh, the last time that I saw it it was single um, and still on its own and that was a few days ago uh, I haven't heard any recent reports um, you know yesterday or the past couple of days I hadn't seen it yesterday I was up on the mountain and I wasn't able to really spend much time watching bears down here at Brooks River. So I'm not sure if it's reunited with its mother or not. It's been on its own for a couple of weeks or so. Um, and, you know, it it has been catching a lot of fish. A, a small bear like that doesn't need a whole lot of fish to get by on a daily basis. And it doesn't need a whole lot of fish to start accumulating fat reserves to go um, into winter hibernation. And I think bears learn a lot from their mothers about where good denning sites are and where of course, um, they can find or, or how they can dig dens, but they also possess, of course, I think the instincts that tell them that this is a good spot to dig a den. This is how I need to dig a den. Whether or not that young bear is going to be able to survive on its own, I can't say. Certainly the odds are against him. A young bear like that, if it's a spring cub or a yearling, it looks pretty young. I'm not really sure what its age is, but it does look like a young bear whether or not it can survive on its own i can't say the odds are certainly against them but it the bears as we we know um surprise us all the time uh bears that i certainly think have no business surviving extreme injuries or su extreme hardships sometimes they surprise even me and they en end up surviving so that's a story that we'll try to watch we'll probably never know um the conclusion to that that lone uh, bear story but it is a story that we get to see here at brooks river we get to see a lot of these bears um, persevere through those hardships, uh, separated from from mother, a young bear on its own for the first time. That can be a very um, difficult thing to watch, but it's part of nature, it's part of the bear world, and it's something that all of these animals here really do have to survive. Um, they have to do it as a two and a half year old, sometimes they have to do it as a younger as a younger bear. Um, but as far as I know, it has not um, reunited with, with its mother. And is hibernation a, uh, a common time for older bears um, to pass away and die? Uh, probably, uh, you know, if you're, if you're a bear that uh, didn't accumulate a lot of fat reserves, then you may starve to death in a den. However, hibernation is your best energy conservation strategy. More than anything else, you know, you're going to be... Um, if you want to save energy and you're a bear, going into your den is going to allow you to do, to do that. However, um, you know, a bear may, all things considered, if it hasn't accumulated enough fat reserves, it may stay out of its den longer um, trying to get, you know, one last meal. That's not to say that if we see a bear in the cam here in December that it's starving and it's not going to survive hibernation. Sometimes adult bears can find food well into um, um, November. So that can um, keep them out of the den. So it, it's hard to say. In naturally regulated populations of bears, like um, what we have here in Katmai National Park, probably uh, the 
Springtime period has a very high mortality rate for bears. You're coming out of the den, you're coming out of the den really thin. If you're a bear that just ate enough to survive the winter um, hibernation period, you're coming into the springtime and you're finding an environment that has almost nothing to eat. The, the grass is yet to start growing. If you're lucky, maybe you can find a, um, a, a moose that happened to die over the winter. But there's not many moose in the area. Um, the bears here, like 480 Otis, he's probably not gonna be able to go to the Pacific side of the park and start to dig for clams. Um, and a bear his size digging for clams probably isn't worth it. He's probably going to be spending more calories digging clams than he actually is. Just eating um, clams and eating grass that's probably more worthwhile for, uh, for smaller bears and younger bears. Big, uh, really mature bears, those, um, those food sources may not be able to give them really the calories they need to survive that, uh, that springtime period. So 480, he's eating for the, uh, next spring. Um, so, again, it's a, it's a hibernation, a common time for bears to pass away. It certainly can be, but bears die in all seasons. They can die in the winter. They can certainly die in the spring. Uh, they um, can die from injuries um, and illness that they, uh, they, they receive and contract in the uh, uh, fall, um, summer and fall, too. So we know that bears die in all seasons, but certainly they can die in the winter and in the spring. And will I be... Um, during the winter, uh, monitoring the chat board and answering questions from King Salmon, I certainly will be. You know, part of my job is to monitor. So it's sort of hard. Well, for a certain period of time, and try to answer questions for you. So I, I definitely want to continue to talk to you about Katmai, um, about bears. Uh, maybe about the volcanoes. We can try to um, talk about the other uh, things that make Katmai significant uh, besides brown bears and salmon, which is the focus that we have here on the cams. But maybe we'll try to do some other things uh, as well. So I'll definitely try to do that from time to time this winter. I'll try to monitor the chat and, um, and uh, do not only um, chat in the comment section, but uh, um, also do some live broadcasts as well. What were the... Um, this is always um, a tough question for me to answer. What What are the best highlights, you know, of this bear's season uh, for you? Were there any challenges? Uh, yeah, you know, there. Uh, I love coming uh, out to the river and watching bears. It's, it's almost you know every time that I come out, it's it's almost a highlight for me. Um, as many of you know, uh, I I really do like to get to know these bears on an individual level. They are wild animals, they are pets, uh, or excuse me, they are not pets. They are wild animals, they are not pets. That's what I meant to say. So please don't edit that. <laughs> but, uh, so it makes me sound, <laughs> sound, like I said, something I didn't want to say. Uh, they, are, they are not pets, they are wild animals, but I do enjoy getting to know them on an individual uh, level, because each one of these bears are, is very different. Um, I get to, I, I do like to watch the stories of certain bears um, and each summer it's it's very um, interesting to me and fulfilling to me to see some of the younger bears that I saw around here as younger sub-adults um, now becoming mature adults and fishing at Brooks Falls like number 32, um, number 89. Uh, I like to watch the stories that those bears um, have um, allowed me to see here. Um, stories of, um, of course, perseverance and resiliency with 89 since he had a leg injury as a cub. Um, also stories of maturation as well. How are these bears using the falls as they age? I mean, that, and, and how has that changed? That's very fascinating uh, to me. Um, so those are highlights of the season that I, that I see every year. Um, I also really like to see the new bears come into the area and watch how they interact at the falls. Certainly watching 775 um, learn hit, how to fish Brooks Falls in July was fascinating. Uh, if you're not familiar with that bear's story, prior to this July, he was a bear that we had only seen uh, in the fall. We had not seen him fish at Brooks Falls or anywhere else on Brooks River uh, in, ju in, uh, in July. Uh, he was only seen in, in September and October. He seemed to be a bear that really wasn't um, tolerant of the presence of people. He seemed to kind of stay away from the river mouth even in October, where there was a lot of um, 
activity associated with people. Uh, but he showed up in in July this year at Brooks Falls, um, and the behavior that he showed tended to indicate to me that he was very very hungry. Uh, he came came around, stole a lot of fish. He was challenging a lot of bears, even some of our very dominant bears here at Brooks River. He was challenging at that time, um, and then of course he was so excited and maybe so. Um, so desperate for some of those first salmon meals that he would belly flop off of the off of the falls behind me here, um, and I think a lot of those belly flops kind of went viral around the internet. And so if you want to see the replay of that, you can probably pretty easily find um, seven seven five belly flopping off of off of Brooks Falls. Um, and while that was very entertaining to watch and somewhat humorous from my perspective, um, I got to think about what was going through the bear's mind at that time. Think like a bear sometimes when you're watching the bears here um, at, at Brooks River. What they might be doing could be humorous or it could be cute, but uh, often in it, it indicates um, a certain, um, uh, almost uh, with in 775's case, a certain desperation. Uh, he, I think he was de desperate to find food, get those first meals of salmon in his belly. And when bears come down to the falls for the first time uh, in, in June or July and catch that first salmon meal, I'm not going to um, say that they they really enjoy eating food like like we do. I don't. I'm not sure. Uh, handing the food that they're putting in their mouth the same way that a human does. But when you see the the look on 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 their on their face um, as they're wolfing down that food, it's almost a. Uh, it's almost like they're satisfied and they feel satisfied when they're eating that meal. So 775 when he came down, chasing other bears, stealing their fish, belly flopping off of, off of the falls. That was the highlight for me. But it indicated to me also, um, happened to be things like just seeing the bears gain weight uh, over, over time. I like watching um, Pav here. Like, um, like 409, Bead Nose, number 410. They are really big, fat bears. They're huge. Uh, in any other ecosystem, they'd be the biggest of the biggest bears, uh, except for maybe Kodiak Island and other parts in the Alaska Peninsula. You took 409 bead nose to Yellowstone, she'd be bigger than the biggest adult males that they have at Yellowstone. She is a big, big girl. Uh, so I enjoy seeing the size change over the course of the year. I really do enjoy seeing um, number uh, 747 grow into a monster bear. Uh, when I got here, he was kind of a goofy young male, kind of like uh, 89 backpack or 32 chunk. But he's a he's a giant bear right now. He could be a, a, a easily a thousand pound plus bear. Really, just a giant animal. So it's very enjoyable to see how these bears change over the years and change uh, throughout the season. So that's kind of a long answer um, to that to that question. Um, but yeah, there's definitely been um, a lot of highlights for me. Um, Challenges, you know, we haven't really faced the same challenges that maybe we did uh, last year. We had a, a bear show up here last year with a wire snare around her neck, and we were able to see um, or take that snare off of her neck. And she's um, a healthy bear. We saw her on the bear cam a lot this year, and I guess that's another highlight for myself is to see 854 Divot come back and look uh, like a very healthy adult bear. So it is uh, sass as a bear, um, and know that you know I had a part in, in helping her. Maybe. Uh, and rectify that mistake, that mistake of getting caught in the snare out of season that was designed for a different animal. Uh, so now we can see her as a, as a healthy, bear, healthy bear along the river. That certainly was a highlight for me. Um, you know, the challenges that I face is um, here as um, you know, a, a naturalist uh, is always you know, learning enough about the animals. And um, of course, here at Brooks River, we're always faced with a lot of challenges to give people really good wildlife viewing experiences, but also at the same time, making sure that, that, there, that everyone here is viewing wildlife ethically, making sure that we are um, giving everyone the right information when they step outside of the visitor center from their bear orientation, that they can go out and make the right choices to give bears space and give the bears, um, you know, enough enough room to go about their business and survive. Because the presence of people here on the river does impact the behavior and the movements of the bears. And we know that the research clearly demonstrates that when people are here, bears use the river differently. Certain bears may not come down to Brooks Falls, for instance, when people are present. And that's why we close the, the falls platform at night during, um, uh, from June 15th to August.
August 15th. We want to give some of those bears the opportunity to fish without um, the presence of people altering their behavior. Um, the lodge closes September 18th, partly because uh, we need to give bears more room at this time of the year. Even though other people can visit uh, at that time of the year, we really do try to heavily emphasize to give bears space in all seasons and especially in the fall because this is the most critical feeding time of the year for bears. So if anybody's contemplating a visit to Brooks River, one of the, one of the things that I challenge you with is to come here and think about how you can view um, bears um, ethically. We want everyone to come here and have a very uh, good wildlife viewing experience. And this is one of the best places in the world to watch brown bears but while you're here uh, certainly I, I challenge you to, to think about how I can make my experience not only or your your bear watching experience not only really good but think how can I make sure that my bear watching experience is the most most ethical and I can have the least impact on the bears because when we do have 10,000 people coming to Brooks River each year that can certainly alter um, how bears use the river and it may negatively impact um, the bears ability to survive so that's something that i want everyone to think about in future visits um it's um about 40 minutes into the chat and i really should uh reintroduce myself if you're joining uh this a little bit late uh, my name is mike fitz and i'm a park ranger at katmai national park and preserve um, and i'm uh, for the rest of the chat here for the next 20 minutes or so i'm going to try to answer uh the questions that are posted in the chat board on explore.org. So I'll do my best to try to answer as many questions as I can. I know that uh, there's a lot of questions still in the queue. Seems like I'm a bit long-winded today, so I'll try to be a, a bit more succinct and answer as many of those uh, questions that I have. But if you want to post more questions for me, uh, post those in the comment section on explore.org and a moderator will be sending those questions um, uh, to me uh, and I'll be uh, looking at those questions and do my best to try to answer those. And I'm standing at world famous Brooks Falls in Katmai National Park. Uh, I am about 300 miles uh, southwest of uh, Anchorage, Alaska at the top of the, of the Alaska Peninsula. So if you're curious, more curious about this location and wondering exactly where I am, you can um, go to the park website, you can download the map of Katmai and find um, exactly where I am. Uh, this is a fantastic place to be, place to be one of the, my uh, favorite places in the world, right here at Brooks Falls, one of the best uh, wildlife viewing locations in the world too, especially if you want to see brown bears. There's almost um, no other place quite like it. There's very few places in Alaska that compare um, to the experience that you can get here at Brooks Falls. And we're very fortunate that the people from Explored.org um, and that organization help to support the CAMS and fund the CAMS and uh, help everyone who can't visit it, uh, the opportunity to have a, a wildlife viewing experience associated with our bears and with Katmai. So back to the questions. Uh, what am I looking forward to um, for next uh, next bear cam season? Well, um, you know, again, I'm looking for the, certain, some of the continuation of these stories that we get to watch from year to year. For example, what about uh, 480 Otis on the far side of the falls behind me? Where will he fit in the hierarchy? He's not the mo you know, as dominant as he used to be. As he ages, will some of those younger bears continue to displace him? Uh, so could, you know, number 32 chunk displace 480 Otis next year? I don't know. It's a distinct possibility. Chunk's going to grow bigger because he's kind of a young adult male. Number 480, as he continues to age, he might, you know, not be as big next year. He might not be as strong next year. Uh, so I'm... I, one of the things that I look forward to each and every um, uh, season here at Brooks Falls is to see how the hierarchy shifts. Um, which bears are most dominant, slipping down in the hierarchy. Very interested to see if 856 will maintain his dominance level at Brooks Falls here in July. What about 747? What about 814? Those, um, those bears are very, very dominant, but where will they fit in the hierarchy next year? Um, those are things that I'm very interested in seeing. And I always like to see which bears are going to come back with cubs. I mean, everyone loves cubs. We like to watch them. We like to see their playfulness, their curiosity. Um, we get to see how they're just, they're just young animals, young animals that are energetic. Uh, they're, you know, they're, they're in a fight for survival, of course, but they, they, they show us that out in nature, it's just not always, um, you know, death and despair. Uh, out in nature, um, those young bears certainly do show us um, that, animals can have fun and that they can play and I like to watch cubs just as much 
is everyone who's on the cams. So I'm very interested to see which adult females are coming back with um, with cubs. And I'm also looking forward um, to seeing whether or not Holly's uh, adopted cub. Number 435 Holly, she adopted a cub last year, still has that cub this year. Um, and I'm curious to know if it's going to come back on its own next year, if she's going to keep um, those the, both of her cubs that she has for another year or not. Um, we might never see that cub again. She might uh, push both of her cubs away and they may decide not to come back to Brooks River. That sometimes does happen. Um, young bears, they will disperse sometimes widely away from their mother's home ranges, but you never know. They could come right back here and fish at Brooks Falls in the future as adult bears. So I'm very curious to see if we end up seeing, um, you know, 435 Holly, uh, Holly's adopted cub come back next year so so some of the those are some of the things that i'm uh looking forward to in the bear story here at brooks river for for uh for next season uh so question 12 here um i know that you've worked at yellowstone and other national parks can you tell us what you like the most about being able to work at katmai well there's a lot of things that i i, I really do love about katmai i am um, I love that it's remote. I do really actually enjoy the remoteness. I've, I've never been one that needs to go out for a night on the town. I'd much rather just kind of uh, spend some time, uh, you know, doing my own thing, uh, whether it's watching bears or um, trying to identify plants, what it, whatever it happens to be. So, uh, so I enjoy the remoteness of Katmai. I enjoy its wilderness landscape. Um, Katmai is a, a big enough place and a place that people not a, that people don't pay attention to like um, like many other places um, in North America. So I found that if I really pay attention to what's going on here, I can discover some novel things, and I really enjoy, enjoy doing that. Um, through my through my work, um, you know, I am able to experiment with different things. I'm able to experiment with different technology um, that al allows us to reach uh, audiences. Um, so that's very interesting to me. Uh, so the freedom to experiment is uh, a very enjoyable part of my job. Um, and getting to uh, talk to people and thousands of people across the world uh, is also very, um, very enjoyable for me as well. So there's a lot of different things that I enjoy about, about Katmai National Park. I enjoy its remoteness. I enjoy its wilderness landscape. I enjoy watching all of the resources here. Not only do I like to watch bears, but I like to watch salmon. I like to watch birds. I, um, I like to explore the volcanoes that we have here. So there's a lot of different stuff that makes Katmai a, a very interesting place. Uh, so this is a, a very special place in, in a lot of different ways. Uh, so, and in a nutshell, I, I like a lot of it. Um, so it, again, I'm going to try to be a bit more succinct because I know there's a lot of questions. But yeah, I like a lot of things about my work here in Katmai and the resources here at Katmai. When do I start work on the, um, the 2016 bear book? Well, I'll try to start working on that um, probably as soon as the bear monitoring uh, data gets consolidated and put into the database so I can refer back to that and I can gain access to the bear monitoring monitoring photos um, that Ranger Leslie um, and, uh, and and other people have taken throughout the summertime because a lot of the photos that you see in the bear identification book um, I take or other other staff here at Cat might take and I I wait until later in the fall when I can can consolidate all of the all of those uh, photos together and all of the information about the bear stories here I don't want to start working on the book um, and updating maybe the page on Otis right now because something could happen, and then all of a sudden, if I issue the book, um, and notice is still remember, then all of a sudden the book may be obsolete. So, um, I want to try to consolidate the, um, all of that information and start working on it later this fall, in this winter, and we'll try to issue um, the next version of that bear ID book in the spring of uh, 2016. So that's something that, that you can look forward to. How many visitors were at um, Brooks uh, Camp this season? So there was uh, this year we're probably going to be close to about 10,000 people. Uh, we keep a pretty good record in our visitor center at um, at the at um, at Knack Knack Lake and near Brooks Lodge because everyone who comes to uh, Brooks uh, Camp has to go through a bear orientation, 
And um, on one of our more recent live chats that Ranger Roy and I did, we were in the Brooks Camp Visitor Center, and we talked a little bit about the bear orientation and what we try to tell people in that orientation. So that's um, by regulation, everyone who comes to Brooks River, uh, when the Visitor Center um, is open, they have to go through a, an orientation. And that explains why um, you have to, or how you have to behave here, explains our food regulations, our gear storage regulations, to make sure that we're protecting ourselves and we're protecting the bears and the experience here at Brooks River. Um, and we keep track of how many people, we keep statistics, of course, of how many people are in that orientation. And this year, it was um, at least a 9,500 that went through that orientation. In, uh, there's also um, a group of people that maybe don't go through the orientation. Maybe they come with a designated guide that is uh, authorized to give the orientation themselves. And I can imagine that there's probably a few hundred people that didn't go through that. So I would be surprised if we were, um, you know, uh, less than 9,000 people this year. Uh, we probably definitely gave out at least 9,500 of the bear orientation pins that we ordered this year. So we went through almost all of our pins this year. So yeah, probably between nine and nine and 10,000 people easily uh, came to Brooks Camp uh, this season. And that's been about average for the past uh, 10 or 20 years or so. Um, and how accessible are the facilities at, at Brooks Camp? Are they wheelchair friendly or is the terrain too difficult? Uh, minimum standards for anybody who has a mobility on the So if you are relying on a wheelchair to get around, a lot of our trails are travel, um, and they may not be very steep in most places, but they are rough surfaces, they're crushed gravel, uh, it, can be, it can be hard for people in wheelchairs to move around. A lot of the buildings aren't that wheelchair friendly. Uh, so, again, um, it can be done, and we do have people that uh, certainly do come here uh, with, uh, with, with wheelchairs each and every season, but it, c it can be uh, a difficult, uh, difficult thing for, for people to, to, to get back and forth if um, you are limited to moving um, in a wheelchair. And I don't know if you're going to be able to hear it, but there is a, um, um, uh, some heavy equipment moving into this area right now. Um, one thing that I should... Um, tell you a little bit about is that they're going to fill in the fish ladder here at Brooks Falls. It's eroding. Um, it's no longer passable to fish. Um, so they're going to fill that in um, uh, to make sure that it doesn't erode away any further and erode the bank where the wildlife viewing platform is, is at. And actually if it eroded away um, significantly, it could really alter the whole dynamic here at Brooks Falls. Uh, it could... Um, change where the river is going and the river could actually all of a sudden migrate through that fish ladder and we would have everything on this side um, washing away and we may not have water running over uh, Brooks Falls. So if you're hearing any equipment in the background, um, that's what it is. They're trying to move some large boulders into that spot to try to block off um, the, the fish ladder and make it a bit more stable so it doesn't erode the bank on, on this side of the river. Uh, so you may see some work associated with that in the future if anybody's working right down below me at the, at the head of the fish ladder. Um, so back to um, the question about the facilities. Um, it could be very difficult also um, for anybody who's um, uh, mobility impaired to get in and out of the small planes that fly to Brooks Camp. If you can get on one of those small planes to fly to Brooks Camp, you can get in and out of those with assistance, then you can walk around Brooks River here. So I certainly think that if you can do that, um, then you can get around to visit the wildlife viewing platforms and get in and out of the buildings. So more than anything else, it probably is the uh, uh, things that limit uh, whether or not you can get to, Brook, to Brooks Falls. And of question 16 here, am I, um, am I sick of camp food by now and will I never eat a pancake all winter? Actually, uh, I could probably eat pancakes most mornings. Uh, I didn't make that many this summer. I tried to ration my blueberry, blueberry uh, supply uh, for that, and I kind of ran out of maple syrup too. So um, I'll have to stock up once I get once I get back to uh, get back to town. Uh, you know, when when we're out here, one of the challenges for the staff working out here is 
that were very, very, uh, very, very remote. Um, if we forget something, it's not easy to get. We just can't go to the grocery store. But sometimes we'll like to treat ourselves with a meal in Brooks Lodge, for instance. The internet has really changed how uh, we live out here. Because if we do forget something, maybe we can't go to the grocery store uh, right away, but we can mail order it through the internet. Um, so, so I don't necessarily feel deprived. It would be nice to maybe um, get out to a city and go to a restaurant uh, and enjoy a and enjoy a meal that I that I don't have to cook. Uh, but. Yeah, back to the other half of that question. I'm certainly going to be eating a lot of pancakes over the winter. And have we seen um, number 284? There's sometimes, uh, I think people have nicknamed um, Electra, and that's not an official nickname for for her, but that's a, a, a nickname that I think a lot of people have been referring to her on the cam. Uh, to me, she'll always be uh, number 284. She was here uh, last week or so. Um, so she hasn't been around all that much. Um, a lot of the bears changed their behaviors from, um, from July to September. Some of the bears, like number 128, who's another um, you know, sizable adult female, we saw her daily at Brooks Falls in July. We don't see her that much uh, right now, although she is, um, excuse me, prowling the river. So um, she, um, number 284 is around, number 128 is around. Uh, you know, a lot of those bears, they kind of tend to come out maybe at dawn and dusk. Uh, for whatever reason, they do change their behaviors as the season progresses. So maybe they want to come and fish at Brooks Falls in July and, um, and do that at all hours because salmon are available at all hours. But maybe as the season progresses, they're just not as tolerant to people. Um, maybe they want to fish under the cover of darkness. Um, I don't behaviors as this, uh, some of them at least as the season progresses. And number 284 has been around. Have I seen um, and a question about a, um, a couple of other specific bears that we have here at Brooks River? Have I seen um, 868 and 83 interact with each other this fall? Do siblings tend to be more tolerant of one another? I have not seen 868 and 83 interact uh, this fall. I have seen them do that in July, and 83 tends to be a little bit larger and a little bit more dominant than 868. And I've seen, um, and if you're familiar with those two bears, they're they're thought to be siblings. They're thought to be brothers. Um, and I've seen at Brooks Falls in July. I've seen he pushed 88 out of the jacuzzi. Ahead, if you're looking on on the cams, that's called the jacuzzi. So. I'm not really sure that siblings are more tolerant of one another. They certainly recognize each other from year to year. Bears are really smart with that keen sense of smell. They can recognize one another from year to year. They're not going to. Um, they're not going to forget. Um, so. So that's something um, that I can say that yeah uh, I haven't seen them interact this fall, but I have seen them interact in the past. I don't think that they're more tolerant of one another. I got a few more questions in here. It's almost three o'clock, and I can see that I, um, I think it's otherwise. So I think it's going to last for another couple of minutes or so here. But if it goes offline, um, thanks for joining me this season. I, I will be again back online from time to time when I'm in King Salmon. And before the camera dies, and before our feed p potentially dies. I want to um, thank everybody at Explorer. For these cams on their thing, uh, Explorer hires that sets up um, the cameras here and the repeaters up on Dumpling Mountain. I'd like to thank them as well, and all of the camera operators too. The camera operators; those are the people working behind the scenes to make this a really great. Um, experience and we uh, this experience would watching the, the bears on the cams would not be as good without our volunteer camera operators they donate um, thousands of hours thousands of hours each year of their own personal time they are not paid to watch the bears here on Brooks River drive the cameras and try to give you a really good bear watching experience so it certainly is a heartfelt thanks to all of those people to make um, this um, experience good for everybody um, and I want to make sure that I said that before I conclude with the broadcast today. But I do have a couple more questions here. Um, 
It is four o'clock, um, so I'll try to get to those questions before I uh, conclude the conclude the broadcast. Um, do sows and cubs nurse all the way until they emancipate their cubs? Uh, they probably do. Uh, cubs um, tend to nurse less frequently as they age, so you'll see two and a half year old cubs nurse a lot less than spring cubs, for instance. Uh, but they will nurse um, as, as long as they're with mom. Uh, what sort of triggers um, the mom to push her cub away is probably um, a matter of weaning. They probably haven't been nursing for a long, long time. Uh, as they come out of the den in the springtime, mother is probably going to go back into estrus, and her, her physiology says, it's time for me to drive this cub away. Uh, and at that time, they're not going to be nursing. So cubs will nurse with their mothers as long as they're with mothers, but the frequency of it is a lot less as they age. And a two-and-a-half-year-old cub uh, will nurse um, a lot less than a spring cub. Do cubs help dig the den? Uh, not sure. Never. I, I've never watched a bear dig a den before. Nothing that I've read about actually indicates that a bear, um, that a that a mother bear, um, sees a cub digging den, a, a den with, with her. Um, well, that's not very a very articulate answer. I don't know. Uh, I don't know if anybody has really witnessed it. However, cubs do mimic the behavior of their moms. So I would not doubt if a cub sees a mom digging into the hillside that it might want to try that out. Not sure, but since um, bear, bear cubs happen to mimic their mom so much, I would not doubt if they do dig right alongside of mom just because they want to do what mom does. That's how they learn how to survive in the bear, bear world, by watching mom and learning from her. And last question that I have in here,